this executive uh, and legislative board. Uh, I'm not a great orator. I'm not a great debater. In fact, you know, political pundits have said that I wouldn't know a sound bite if it didn't end up over there. I acknowledge <laughs> that, you know, I'm not a great politician. But I'm glad to be here because I believe these types of forums are fundamentally important to people who I should be able to hear both Democratic candidates across the state so they can make a choice about who would serve them best. And so I'm glad to be here. I just want to share my story. Hope you are open to listen. You know, my grandparents uh, came to Hawaii in search of a better life from Okinawa and Japan. They worked very hard on the plantation to give their children better opportunities. My father grew up at Evo Plantation. He volunteered to serve in the 100th Battalion at a time when they were classified as enemy aliens because he felt compelled to prove his loyalty to the United States of America. After the war, he went on to become a steel worker and worked in many projects that built this community. My mother grew up on Kahuku Plantation. You know, she finished the eighth grade and really had nowhere to go. She left the state of Hawaii to go to Denver so she could finish high school. She finished high school at East Denver High School, went on to St. Jude's College of Nursing because she always had a dream of being a nurse. You know, my father taught me about leadership he taught me that great leaders say what they do and do what they say. It really is about walking the talk. And my mother really taught me the lesson that education really is a great enabler for all of us. Um, I was born in Honolulu, raised in Pearl City, five brothers. Uh, when at a time when Pearl City was country, country, one of the roads was Cane Hall Road, and there was sugar cane everywhere. I attended public schools, graduated from Pearl City High School, uh, and then went on to the University of Hawaii, where I met my future wife, Dawn. Uh, we have been married now for 31 years. Uh, we were running for office in student government at the university when we first met. Uh, and then she went on to um, bigger and better things. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's in electrical engineering, and then after starting working, I finished an MBA from the University of Hawaii. Uh, we got married 31 years ago. Our 32nd anniversary is in a week and a half. And we have three lovely children as we heard. You know, I have 35 years in the private sector as an engineer and business executive. I've had the pleasure of working and excelling in a Fortune 500 company like GTE, Hawaiian Tel, as well as an internet startup where your job description is whatever you need to get done. I've also enjoyed 29 years in the legislature where my, my colleagues have asked me to take leadership positions in virtually every year and have a proven record of accomplishment, education, reform, economic development, venture capital, and the rest. I'm running for governor because this election is about the future of Hawaii. It's, Hawaii is not headed in the right direction. We know that too many decisions are being made on behalf of special interests rather than public interests. And I'm here to give the people of Hawaii a choice. Thank you. I can see, and that's not the first time I'm sure uh, this audience has heard of elected officials saying they're delighted uh, to be with people, but no one will mean it more than I do today. You know, it's, it's just about 40 years ago to this day that being here in Manal, in Lower Manal, was the start of my political career. Not more than two or three blocks from in Lower Manoa, around Honeywell, Seaview. All those folks in District 13, Precinct 4, I remember. Can you help us? 
I was just going around a kid from the from the university, uh, making my start because I was so interested in education, going and asking people to give me a chance. And they were saying, can you help us? Would you be able to help us? And I said, you may not know me. You may have only this contact with me. Maybe that'll be the same way today, 40 years later. Maybe some of you are just seeing me or meeting me for the first time. What I said to them was, I, I hope you get a shield for me. I hope you get some understanding, the passion and the commitment I want to bring. I'm going to take what talents I have, take what experience I can gain, if you give me that opportunity, I'll try to put it to work for you for Hawaii. Because I love Hawaii. And I love being in Manoa. The very first night I spent in Hawaii was in Manoa, up on Armstrong Street. Right next to Audie Kimura's mom and dad. Those of you who know, uh, Audie's been almost 40 years, I think, down at the at High Steakhouse down in Waikiki. And they rented our, our first cottage to us there. Henry Oshihara, he'd come here out of an internment camp. He was in grad school, I was in grad school, came to Hawaii to go to grad school. I first ran $50 a month. If you saw Olympia spin this helmet in the paper, I went down to Olympia Smith, he sold me my first car. 1937 Dewey Coupe, 50 bucks. So between the $50 rent that we were splitting and the $50 Dewey Coupe that I got from Olympia Smith, with a warranty, by the way. Olympia <laughs> said, don't worry, bro, as long as I can see you, guarantee on the car. That was the, that was the why. So it's 40 years, 40 years ago, that I asked people for their trust. I asked them to put a little faith in me and to give me a chance. And that's what this is about today. The issues then were the same, the economy, education, the environment. We called it carrying capacity in those days. Now it's sustainability. But the issues are the same. I actually ran on how can we, how can we conserve water? How are we going to be able, here in the middle of the Pacific, 2,500 miles away from the, from the rest of a major landmass, how are we going to be able to survive? How are we going to be able to guarantee fresh water? take care of our island. And so I put together our, our, our uh, Rain Falls the Forest, our watershed proposal, as soon as I got to be, uh, the opportunity to be governor. Those are the kinds of things and commitments that I made. I made one other commitment. My mother told me from when I was a little kid, she was a kindergarten teacher, a real kindergarten teacher. She knew that her little boys were going to be kind of students that she wanted in her kindergarten. Sit up straight, speak up, and speak clearly. The only problem with that formula was is sometimes while I've been speaking clearly, I spoke so clearly people got upset with me. Uh, that, that didn't get such a big laugh. I know. <laughs> That's the way that, that, that happens. If you're going to be committed, if you're going to deal with the issues, you're not always going to be able to keep your friends from having to take a, a position that is going to satisfy the, the, the greater good. You have to sometimes say to your friends, look, we've all got to put this in together. Like in 2010 with the furloughs, with the layoffs, with the deficits. I said we all had to put our paddles in the water and pull deep and pull together. If we did, we can get to the shore. I think I spoke clearly in 2010 when I came into office. I think. I stood up or sat up straight when I did, and I think that I spoke up. And now we see the results. We're back, we're on track, we're in the black. Thank you very much. Seconds and for the love of God, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, as a fight we got on Paul's side, uh, side coat down there, we will be uh, keeping time, which brings us back to a musical theme, I suppose. All right, let's go to uh, the uh, first set of questions. We started with the issue of housing and land use. Paul Brubaker says that uh, Oahu single-family home prices could reach 800 k within three years. Many of Hawaii's working family in Keiki won't be able to afford to live here. Do you believe Hawaii is in dire need of housing, and do you have any ideas for whether there's something that can be done about this? Senator? Absolutely. You know, housing is a statewide issue. The, the cost of housing continues to be the number one driver in the cost of it is a concern, you know, when I talk to my children about their future in Hawaii, they often, the biggest ex concern they express is really about the cost of housing. So there are a couple of things I think that we need to do. Uh, we do need to look at available lands and ensuring that they are available to development. And most importantly, it really is looking at development that is targeted for residents rather than multi-million dollar luxury developments really sold to foreign investors uh, rather than our community. It really is about looking at the agriculture lands and sometimes people don't think about agriculture, but you know, we have 1.9 million acres zoned in agriculture. We really need to look at that land, determine what the infrastructure needs to get it into production so that we can begin to produce the food that we want to eat. You know, and then most importantly, we need to update the long, long range plans for land use, identify uh, development within the urban core as the, most of the plans uh, determine. We have a prime opportunity with the rail project and, and looking for infill development along the mass transit route that would provide opportunities for affordable housing. And then most importantly, I believe we need to look at the state land inventory and look at those opportunities for working with nonprofit corporations to provide rental assistance housing, low-income housing, and affordable housing all along the rail line. I mentioned the flow and off before. And that may become a, a theme for me this evening, or this afternoon, because of of this location of the Japanese Cultural Center here. It didn't exist then. These are the kinds of legacies that we have to look at. People came here from all over the world looking for a new life. People came here from all over the world at different times, yes, but from all over the world looking for that opportunity. An opportunity to establish a family and a community they could be proud of with a future. And that's where housing comes into it. I'm thinking a lot about it. I appreciate the realtors being one of the sponsors tonight because you're looking at somebody and you're looking at, at a couple, Nancy and I. We saved 23 years up on Pukuhomua Street, right up here with the Chong family. God bless them. And I came and knocked on his door when I was campaigning. He said, You know, I got a place downstairs. And our friends had mentioned to us that this place might be open downstairs. For their boys were down there. We saw them through Stevenson Elementary, all the way through to being teachers today and planners. We lived there for 23 years on a handshake. 23 years on a handshake. Try and do that today. It's really, it's really difficult. Before we got our house, our down payment, we stayed for 30 for, for 23 years just to get our down payment. So I can tell you, I'm speaking and reaching out to all of those. The young families that are out there, probably some of them working for you, some working for some of the people in this room. We need to build in the urban core so that we avoid urban sprawl, so we can keep the country country. We need to make an investment in housing for our young people, livable communities. This, this government, this administration is already doing that. We're not talking about it, we're thinking about it, we're doing it. Here's a follow-up question for both of you, uh, whether you think there would be any advantage in incentivizing homeownership with deductible interest or credits or 
or some other idea of uh, tax incentives that might to change the way this is going. We're doing that right now uh, with our housing, uh, Hawaii Housing Development Corporation. We have uh, listed right now for, for uh, uh, a proceeding with over nine, just under uh, 10,000 homes that are going to be aimed at, at middle income families that need the housing, that want to have the housing. But then you have to figure out and be practical about it. You have to be accountable for what you say and what you say you believe in. If we're going to have housing, particularly on the island of Oahu, and you don't want urban sprawl, you have to think about the urban core. That's the only sensible, practical way to do it. Now, obviously, there are concerns about whether we're moving too far, too fast, too much. Of course, that has to be taken into account. But that can't allow us to stop. We can't uh, take into account the needs of the supply not meeting the demand for housing if we don't do the incentives. And that's the, where the housing tax credits come in. Right now, right now, Hollywood Wheeler Place has 200 families moving in because of the tax credit that we're able to put together to get the development to come in. Development isn't a bad word when it's put together for development for the people. There'll always be a high-end market. There'll always be that kind of development out there. But for us, we have the tax incentives right now. We're building the houses right now. We're building the units right now that are going to meet those middle income needs. And the tax credits are there, and we're working with the developers to see that it's going, it's going to get done. Thank you. Sir? Um, certainly. Thank you, Howard. Um, yes, I am aware that we have the tax credits in place right now. We also have created, um, first of all, interest uh, deductible interest. Uh, payments is deductible, and that has been a tremendous help. You know, we did uh, appropriate this past session, uh, increase the ceiling $250 million for the Hula Maid program. And, you know, I bought my first condominium right after graduating from the University of Hawaii uh, with my bachelor's in electrical engineering uh, through the Hula Maid program. And it really is focused on helping um, young people get their first start in the housing market. Uh, it definitely was an opportunity that if I did not have that Hulumi program, I would not be able to have bought my first house. So I think the Hulumi program is an excellent program for first-time home, uh, home ownership. Um, the tax deduction is important. We have authorized uh, more in the rental housing assistance program. Uh, $33 million will be going into the rental uh, assistance trust fund. And really is an opportunity to work with nonprofits to build rental, more rental housing throughout the community. I think that those opportunities uh, provide um, affordable housing in uh, various areas. Let's turn to taxation for a moment uh, and talk about the general excise tax. Uh, do you see any future need to increase it? And under what uh, circumstances would you consider that? Senator? Um, I am opposed to an increase in the general excise tax. I believe that we need to collect the taxes that are already owed uh, more efficiently before we talk about any increase in the general excise tax. I have heard throughout the community that people feel like they're not getting good value for their tax dollar, and raising the general excise tax would be the biggest mistake that we could. Uh, two years ago, we appropriated more than $60 million for upgrading the tax system. Unfortunately, that project's a little bit behind schedule, but I believe that once we modernize the tax collection system, we will see a significant increase in tax collections uh, that are already old. And we need to focus on that. Our government needs to live within its means uh, before we can look at getting more taxpayer funds from you, the taxpayer governor. This is all about financial management. This is not about a budget as such. By statute law, ladies and gentlemen, the governor has to have a six-year financial plan, has to put it forward. The legislature has the luxury, perhaps, of, of taking a short-term view. In fact, there, there are two financial plans uh, before the state right now that, have, that affect the GDP. My financial plan, for the next six years, does not contemplate any increase in taxes in the GET. 
and it operates in the black. Remember I said, we're back, we're in the black, we're on the right track. The only other budget plan out there anticipates, in fact, uh, commands that we operate in a deficit. Remember three years ago? Think back, think back with me. Remember about three years ago, furloughs, layoffs, program costs, deficits. That's the budget that's being proposed right now. That's the only budget that's out there in the, in the budget plan. In fact, I can tell you exactly what it says. The state will avoid violating the constitutional requirement for a balanced operating budget by drawing down on the $844 million energy balance. We came from $200 plus million deficit three years ago to over $800 million ending balance with this administration. And the only proposal for a budget that's out there is to spend that down, make the same mistakes that we made before, to draw down on what we've accomplished. My plan, this administration's plan, is to be in the black and stay in the black. We're going to continue to make investments in people and infrastructure that are going to see us through, to see us stay in the black so that we can have the future that people talk about. Leadership means acting on what we need to know and what we need to do to see that we stay in the black and have that future we all want. I'm going to uh, skip to a, a question that just came to us because it's, it's tax related, so it dovetails with this. Hawaii is one of seven states that tax the people making the minimum wage. Can that be changed? I'm sure it can be changed. You know, we had various proposals to uh, look at that. And, you know, it is about balancing the budget. I just wanted to be very clear. The legislature has cut a billion dollars of the governor's requests to the legislature over the last four years. This past session, we cut more than $250 million from the governor's budget. So the only budget is the budget that's passed by the state legislature, which um, I put into place. Be very clear about what that, that um, balance is about. Uh, we've also rejected the calls for tax increases. Uh, we rejected the, the tax on pension. We rejected the tax on soda. We rejected the tax on uh, many other things that have been proposed because we believe in living within our means. Now, the, the notion of uh, adjusting the tax on those um, earners in our economy is always before the legislature. It really is about balancing budget and making choices. I'm going to squeeze in another late arriving question because it dovetails with what uh, was being discussed just a moment ago about. Uh, Developing the urban core. What is your position on Kaka'ako high rises that exceed the current 400 foot limit, uh, Senator? We passed the bill this session to, to cap the height of any building in Kaka'ako at 480 feet, period. Now, there is a process for variances. We hope that the variances, we believe that there should be development. I support development in Kaka'ako. It's very important for us for a lot of reasons. I think that development should be focused on housing for residents. I think that we should be focused on designing to the design criteria that already exists in Kaka'ako, rather than seeking variances or extensions or double densities or triple densities or quadruple densities, because that's what strains the infrastructure that is currently in place. Governor? Yes, I signed uh, uh, 1866. Uh, limitation. You, uh, as you recall just a, a few moments ago, when you make changes, when you take an area like Kaka'ako, for example, that has been abandoned for 37 years, underutilized, unused for 37 years, and you come to try to make a livable community down there where people are able to create the kind of people like my wife and myself that, that were able to save and get our little house. That's the kind of development we're talking about, to build those communities, complete streets, landscaping, open space, of course. 
We're building those units right now. There are 1,700 units for middle income families, working families there now, another 1,600 in progress as we speak. I just ask you to go down to Hollywood Street, the Hollywood Place, and take a look at the 200 units that we put in there right now. You know what it's next to, in case you can't find it? Mother Waldron Park. When's the last time anybody in here went down to Kakaako and Mother Waldron Park? You don't go down there because it is abandoned, essentially, but you will now. There's over $550,000 of rehabilitation of Mother Waldron Park going on right now. When you go to an Eat the Streets movement down there, thousands of people come down there, especially young people. So I am a strong advocate for saying we're going to build a new community, a community that's livable, walkable, where people can live and work and play and that's the kind of community that we're going to have there in our building right now ask the people that are moving in this very minute and ask the workers that are building those units right now whether they want to live in them they do every time one of these units comes up it is oversubscribed by hundreds even thousands yes the urban core is going to prevent urban sprawl and the urban core in honolulu is going to provide a new avenue for everyone to be able to have a livable community Back to uh, taxes. <laughs> Hawaii, I am told, currently has the second highest personal income tax rate in the country. The current Hawaii income tax rate is scheduled to sunset next year. Uh, we'd like to give either one of you a chance to correct me if I'm wrong on any of that, or if there's something I left out that makes it different. But beyond that, what is your proposal with respect specifically to state income taxes? Well, when we talk about uh, taxes, whether it's a personal income uh, or any other tax, we have to take into account why Hawaii is different. Think about it. Let's take a look at the facts. In many other places on the mainland, uh, there are, there's a county, there's towns, there's villages. They have various tax rates associated with property. The realtors uh, who are here today will, will verify this. And when you have that kind of a situation, that means the tax burden is split, and the ta taxes, say personal income taxes or state taxes, uh, may reflect the, uh, the fact that you have a multi-layered tax system. Here in Hawaii, the state takes on what is generally out in counties or other, other district, uh, political district locations. Even educational districts have their own taxation. Here in Hawaii, the general revenues paid for all of education there are no county property taxes or state property taxes in order to pay for the, uh, our school system. And there's a reason for that. We've got islands. We have rural areas. If the back of my palm is the island of Oahu, half the population of the state lives where my palm is. Think about it. Half the population of the state right here in the urban core. That's one of the reasons why, why we're going to have to develop our housing in the urban core. But that means our children and our families are spread out all over the state. We take on the hospital system. The state does. So when it comes to taxes, personal income taxes, and the GET and general revenues taxes, Hawaii is unique. And it is unique because we're all for one and one for all. We don't differentiate in this state. Whether you're a neighbor islander, whether you're in Ka'u or Kailua or Kahala, we all share. That's what our tax system is about. Senator. Yes, Howard, I am aware that the temporary increase in the personal income tax does expire, uh, and we decided to let it expire. So there will no, be no continuation of that temporary increase in personal income tax. Uh, it was included in the financial plan, so our finances uh, does reflect the fact that the personal, the temporary personal income tax increase will expire uh, as scheduled, and I have no intention of asking for an increase in per personal income taxes. One person asked a question about uh, the, how business is nurtured here versus other states, and uh, cited as an example, uh, asserted that Texas has a favorable tax structure to encourage businesses to prosper and grow. Uh, apart from whether you agree or disagree with the Texas situation, 
Is there another state out there that you like as a model or which is doing something that you would like to replicate here in Hawaii, Senator Eastern? Certainly. You know, I have been a supporter of targeted tax credits to focus on encouraging certain investments and business activity. Uh, and I think we need to revisit that as we look to grow our economy and diversify our economy. Uh, we have been very successful uh, with venture capital and making um, investments in technology businesses um, that attracted significant investments and new equity uh, investments in startup companies. Uh, and I think that that's part of what we need to be doing. You know, the uh, corporate income tax is a relatively small portion of the income that the state uh, uses. Uh, it's a fraction of the total revenues uh, that come into the state. Um, but we need to do more to support small businesses uh, in helping them create business activity and helping them create jobs. This past session, we did uh, work with the chamber to look at a manufacturing tax credit uh, to look at the opportunity to encourage investment uh, in manufacturing. As many of you know, there is new uh, equipment and possibilities that provide opportunities to support our small businesses. So I think in general, Howard, we would need to look at what the cost benefits of these tax credits might be and what specific business activity we would like to encourage to help our economy grow. Governor. Let's stop dealing in generalities. The question was business nurturing. What this administration done in order to accomplish that? Texas was great. A perfect example. The reason you don't have uh, taxes at, at the top uh, for Governor Perry in Texas is because they shift the taxes to everybody else down below. The counties, the towns, the villages, they're all being taxed to death there. So and the claims for the jobs that, that come from, from Texas are completely bogus. They don't take any of the responsibilities that we have for, for hospitals, for health care, for, for, for housing, for, uh, for education. And so how do you then take the idea of nurturing business and put it into practical reality? You do it the way this administration did. We held the line. I asked everybody to sacrifice. Not everybody was happy about that. I said that. I understand that. But I promised results. And you have results. We went from that deficit to the $800 million plus ending balance because we made the infrastructure investments that got business going again. We have more people employed today than ever before in the history of the state. We have the lowest unemployment rate that we've had in eight years. Think about that. There are people working out there of supporting those small businesses out there because our unemployment rate is down and going down. If you're an employer out there, we were bankrupt with the unemployment insurance fund because so many people were out of work. Today we've got a $300 million surplus in it and we're taking $130 million of the cost of business and eliminating that and we're going to do it again next year. I personally, I personally go to movies. I personally go I personally go to Standard & Poor's, I personally go to Fitch to present this state's case. We've gone from negative to stable to positive in three years. Our infrastructure investment in people and programs is having a positive effect on business all across the state. I couldn't be prouder of my team that helped to bring this about. talk about energy costs and energy policy. Do you believe the state, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, and the utilities are doing enough to lower energy costs and increase the use of renewables? There is no question that when I came into office, I indicated that energy was going to be one of our top priorities. You may know, and I hope you do. Let's look at the facts. The Public Utilities Commission has just issued orders and findings to the electric utilities indicating that they're going to have to do exactly that. We're going to have to move from a corporate model of selling electricity into a model of distributing electricity and energy. 
and they are under orders to come up with a process to do that. We're in the process right now with, with our GEMS program, our Green Energy uh, Securitization Program that's going to allow people to put photovoltaics. I see heads nodding all around the room for those of you who, who can't see it. They know that we're, we're making accessibility and the possibility of people moving to photovoltaics, to move, moving to using the sun to create their own energy uh, in a, a, a way that has never been possible before. We're going to have on-bill financing for that. We're reaching out to the people who need to have the break when it comes to energy costs. And we're seeing to it that you're going to be able to create that energy. So what between the public utilities uh, commands to, to the utility and the state supporting uh, the alternative and renewable energy process, we're going, not only going to succeed, we're leading the country. We have more photovoltaic operations going on now than ever before. But let's take what the state can do about that. In our airports, we are now going to save $225 million just on lighting alone as state buildings were doing it. We're putting photovoltaics on all the school roof buildings across the state. So whether it's the state itself, my friends, or whether it's the average cost that goes to the individual homeowner and, and, and renter that has to pay energy bills, this administration is moving forward on energy. We're taking the lead and we're not going to turn back. Senator. Yes, most certainly. I think we can all be proud of the fact that the state of Hawaii is leading the country with uh, renewable energy and photovoltaic deployment. I think that's a great opportunity for all of us. I think it's really important about looking at the facts, though. You know, the legislature had to drive the Public Utilities Commission to accelerate grid modernization. We passed this uh, bill this session, directing them to be more aggressive with the utilities about ensuring that the um, utility networks can accommodate more photovoltaic and renewable energies on the grid because that's what we heard from the people. The legislature forced the restructuring in the Public Utilities Commission because so many of the important documents were being bogged down. Those of you in the industry know that the decisions were not being made because the Public Utilities Commission couldn't hire the staff or did not get the support of the administration to take on the important dockets that was before them and they were getting bogged down. We transferred the department to DCCA because we believe that they would be better supported there. And we provided additional flexibility for hiring of staff and professionalizing that organization because we heard from all of you that too many things were getting bogged down in the Public Utilities Commission. And I am still concerned that if we don't have an appointed chairman of the Public Utilities Commission to be during this very, very critical summer. Thank you. Let's turn to uh, health care and health insurance. Uh, how do you feel uh, the Affordable Care Act is doing here in Hawaii, and how do you feel about this idea that's uh, being brewed about right now that we should shut down the Hawaii Health Connector and default to the national system? Senator? You know, I am disappointed in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in Hawaii. You know, we have an explicit exemption from the federal law because our prepaid health program in Hawaii that we developed over 30 years, really should be the model for covering and providing universal coverage for all of our people. Hawaii leads the nation in the lowest Medicare costs. Hawaii leads the nation in the, having the fewest number of uninsured. Hawaii leads the nation in the longest lifespan of our communities. And I believe we have the best health care across the country. Now, the health connector has been a disaster. You know, we have spent so much money, more than $204 million have been spelt on, spent on the health connector. And the last time I checked, they signed up less than 10,000 um, people enrolled in the system. You know, we need to do better in this session, although they asked for us to give them a forever subsidy so that they can continue to operate. The legislature said no. We provided stopgap funding and we told them they need to get their act together. 
you know, we should have requested an uh, exemption from the Affordable Care Act because we have the best uh, health insurance plan in the country. You know, now we see what the impact is that not doing that is on our healthcare system. You know, many companies are seeing skyrocketing insurance costs because we have to age rate insurance now in the state of Hawaii. We never had to do that and we should never have done that. Thank you. Well, uh, you heard claims uh, today about what the legislature did. The legislature did this, the legislature did that. Well, what is the health connector? It's completely a creature of the legislature. It didn't. <laughs> My friends, the health connector didn't suddenly appear. It wasn't spontaneous combustion. It's a nonprofit corporation completely created by the legislature. And honestly, we don't need, we don't need, we don't need uh, lectures about the 1974 Prepaid uh, Care Act because I helped to get that started from 1970, the 1974 election when I came into office. Of course, the reason there's only 10,000 and, and why we didn't need to have that and why the state administration can do it, I'd be happy uh, to, to do it, to have our, our folks in Health and Human Services, the Department of, of, uh, of uh, Labor and Industrial Relations and our consumer protection folks uh, uh, handle it. The reason there's only 10,000 is because the prepaid health care act uh, works so well that there's very, very few people that are going to be eligible for it. And many of those are going to be on Medicaid, and we've signed them up. The administration has signed them up already. So I'm, I'm quite content uh, to get a waiver for the uh, uh, affordable, uh, through the Affordable Care Act, which we're doing. The administration is already doing that. We're moving ahead to get a waiver as soon as it's possible under the Affordable Care Act. That's exactly what we're going to apply for. If the legislature is upset with how the connector is working, I suggest that they get a mirror. <laughs> Let's turn to education for a moment. Yes. <laughs> What do you think about the UH Regents, Governor? <laughs> <laughs> a very, a very fine group of people whose names come to the governor from a committee I don't control. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, I'm pretty sure he's finished. <laughs> I did want to just take a second to set the record straight. The Health Connector Board of Directors has four cabinet members sitting on that board that are directly and have been directly involved with every single decision that the Health Connector has made since its inception. To pretend like the governor is not involved with the Health Connector, I think is absolutely inaccurate. I will point out to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the four cabinet members sit there because the legislature says they have to. Yes, absolutely. But anyway, to the region, you know, I, um, I think we've had, um, we've had many discussions with the regions. As you know, the Senate confirms the regions, and we have raised the profile and demanded more accountability from the regions. We told them that they need to represent each and every one of you. You know, the legislature has delegated to the regions significant flexibility and autonomy to run the university, to hire staff, to appoint the president. And in our confirmation activities, we have made it very clear to each and every region that they need to represent you. So when you have a concern about that golden parachute for the president leaving office, you know, call your regions because we made it clear that they're accountable for the decisions made at the university. Thank you. I want to do a follow-up on you. Uh, David Lasner is going to, well, I hope he's going to do whatever he feels is best to improve you, age, but what might he do that would meet with your most heartfelt support? Uh, you start with um, 
there are a couple of things I think that are very important um, for the university president. I think first and foremost, it really is about remembering that it's the University of Hawaii system to get back to the system point of view, rather than blocking development of West Oahu, rather than trying to uh, starve it by not supporting it. I've talked with President Lasner about how important it is that the president take a system view and look at what's in the best interest of the community. We, I believe strongly that West Oahu campus will grow as fast as we can fund it. The people, the students on the west side want to go to that campus. And the university has been starving it. This session, we, the legislature, initiated and appropriated five, four million dollars in additional general fund support for that campus. And the university system has provided less than a million dollars. We believe that the university budget has to be balanced, that we need to respond. The community colleges, West Oahu, UH Hilo have an important role to play in each and every community. And I just reminded the president that he is the president of the University of Hawaii system, and that it's more than the University of Hawaii on all campus, and that we need to ensure that the university is being very well managed and providing the opportunities that allow our young people to to live their dream. Thank you. Governor, one of the first things that the president last year needs to do, of course, is to make sure that we have a, a good faculty and speaking of expenses, that we're able to get a, a contract that recognizes the terrific work that they did. I'm a graduate of the university, my friends, twice over. I came to Hawaii in 1959 to be a graduate teaching assistant at the university. I love the University of Hawaii. I believe green, believe me. And when it comes to the university, I understand. When I was chair of the Higher Education Committee, I was criticized because I put forward capital improvement projects and funding for the neighbor islands, for the community colleges out there, and eventually for the University of Hawaii at, at, at Hilo as it got underway. And they said, but you represent Manoa, that, that, that's where you come from. How come you're not putting the money in there? Because I said, this is in fact a system, a university system. And I said, we're all for one and one for all. We're, we're an islands, not an island, islands wide with the university. And so I think one of the first things that he needs to do is to make sure that we get a contract. And I think uh, that very, very shortly, the President Lasker and I will be making an announcement that we, we think that we're going to be able to put together a contract it will stabilize uh, the uh, public contracts uh, for the university a year ahead of time. That's the kind of thing we're doing all across the, the, the entire spectrum. And I want to remind you of one thing, ladies and gentlemen. Please, let's remember, the university does not appropriate its own money. The university can only distribute the funds that it gets from the legislature. If the legislature underfunds the university system, then the system cannot respond other than with the funds that it gets. If you're looking to see support for the university, then go to the legislature and see that the legislature can, gets that money to the university so it can do the kind of distribution that sees that we have equality of effort on all our campuses all across the state. For the, for the sake of the education topic, we've got two gentlemen who are both passionate about education, and if they ever take their eye off the ball, they've both got wives who are educators to remind them about this. Um, tell me what you'd like to see change about the state school system, the public school system. Governor, you start this. I think, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask everybody to just reflect a moment or two on what's taking place besides the governor. Because when this constitutional amendment comes up on our capacity to be able to have partners with the community providers in preschool, when this comes on the ballot, it's going to be as important, and perhaps even more important, uh, than the governor's election or any of the, of the elections that are on there. Because politicians come and go, elected officials and elections come and go. But the opportunity to be able to partner with community providers to see that our preschoolers have its chance to start in the life that they deserve. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. 
I might be running for office. Senator Egan might be running for office. That's a transitory thing. But every child who gets to be four years old and loses that year never gets it back. Never gets it back. The single most important thing that's on the ballot, the single most important factor that we have to take into account where education is concerned is to give our youngsters the capacity to be able to lead the life of success that we want them to have. Yes, my mom was a kindergarten teacher. My brother's a teacher. I'm a teacher. My wife's a teacher. And all teachers understand, particularly elementary and middle school teachers, that a child that comes into elementary school who has that you see how I'm passionate about this. Yes, I am. Because I know that this is our opportunity to set a future for these kids. 80% of a child's brain is completed by the age of three, 90 by five. Those 17,000 four-year-olds that come in every year depend entirely on us, on our judgment, on their behalf. We need to take the 400 kids of the 17,000 that we're supporting right now at 18 elementary schools out of 114 and say to them, we're with you. We're with your future. We're for preschool. We're for passing the constitutional amendment that will let us partner with our community providers and provide for the future for our children. Thank you, Howard. You know, I have had a 52-year relationship with the public school system, uh, beginning at Cole City Elementary School. I really do believe it's one of the most important functions of state government. And I've learned to my direct experience that the key to improving student learning is in the classroom. It is the interaction between the teacher and the student. It's the most important part of educational reform, and we are missing the boat. We have heard so much about how the system has become so centralized. The schools are being inundated by orders and directives from the board uh, and the superintendent. And principals have complained that they no longer have the authority or ability to make decisions on behalf of the people, of the students. Those decisions are being made elsewhere. I believe that we need to restore autonomy and empower schools and get the resources into the classroom. That's the most important thing that we can do. It's really selecting board members that understand that it's important, that the most important interaction is between the teacher and the student in the classroom, and then support delivering resources directly there. What are you prepared to do to help Hawaiians reinstate their sovereignty, and please be as specific as possible? <laughs> Well, I, I think I've had the most experience with this, so I'll, I'm pleased to speak about it. Uh, my first experience was uh, with Richard Kawakami from Kauai. His untimely passing, I think, was a real tragedy for, for, for this state. I, I believe he would have gone on to, to even greater leadership uh, qualities. Uh, I'm happy to have note that the Derek Kawakami, from, uh, the legacy of that family is taken is uh, and in the legislature right now, carrying on that family tradition. And the reason I say uh, uh, Richard Kawakami is one of my first assignments in, in, uh, when I was elected in 1974 was on the Water, Land, and Hawaiian Homes Commission, uh, the Hawaiian Homes Commission, the Hawaiian Homes Committee, that we had to deal, of course, with the Hawaiian Homes Commission. And it's interesting, right? Water, Land, Hawaiian Homes. It, 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 uh, it resonates today. And so, uh, one of the questions I came up with then as a rookie in that committee is, well, with, with the ceded land and the, and, and, uh, and the uh, act that put us into, into the United States, uh, commanding that we, we deal with Hawaiian sovereignty and ceded lands and everything associated with it, why, why don't we just turn that over to the Hawaiians and, 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 and let them come to the conclusions about those areas of, of Hawaii that they have not only control over but, but uh, are entitled to? And he said, that's what we're trying to accomplish. So whether it was a Kohala lobby, 
whether it's with the Kupuna program, uh, Elders program, a Hawaiian immersion, whether it's the three times that I passed the Akaka bill in, re in Republican and Democratic Congresses when we could really come to a conclusion then, or whether it's right now saying that I support the system of, of the role commission to give Hawaiians the opportunity to create a, a governing entity for themselves. Um, from my political career, I have been supportive of it in every single instance where I've had the responsibility in the jurisdiction. Senator. Thank you. You know, I think it's important to understand for everyone who lives in Hawaii or calls Hawaii home that in 1893, a great injustice was done to the Hawaiian community and the Hawaiian nation. And we have been struggling with how to right that injustice for every year uh, since. Um, you know, sovereignty is something that I think cannot be rushed. It's something that will impact each and every resident uh, in our community. Um, it does start with self-determination. And as Governor has said, the role commission was our attempt to um, sign up Hawaiians, have them be able to vote for representatives and create a process to establish a constitution and a Hawaiian nation. I know that recently there's been hearings uh, convened by the Depart U.S. Department of Interior. I do believe that those hearings are premature because the Hawaiian community really needs to work through uh, their determination about what the form of government should be. But I think it's most important for all of us here in that room to recognize that the host culture has given all of us this gift that we call Hawaii. Their core values infuses everything that is Hawaii today. Uh, and although the conversation about self-determination starts in the Hawaiian community, it needs to extend to each and every one of us because the final outcome of that self-determination will impact each and every one of us. Thank you. If the legislature ever authorizes casino gambling and you are the governor, would you sign it or veto it, Senator? I would absolutely veto it. I'm against gambling. You know, I think that it kills jobs. I believe that it brings social ills that have no purpose in Hawaii. I believe that casino gambling would change Hawaii forever, for the worse, and I would veto it immediately. Governor? Well, I think that when it comes to gambling, I think the principal veto would be by everybody who flies Hawaiian to Las Vegas uh, to go to the California Hotel. And uh, the Honolulu Star Advertiser then wouldn't have its big advertising section. So I don't see any, any possibility there's going to be any casino. That's, uh, uh, you'll never get to the point of having a dealer. All right, I'm going to do a ship cockfighting question then. <laughs> uh, but let's uh, do something else that's controversial and uh, get you uh, to give your uh, feelings about. Uh, GMO labeling proposals. Governor, you want to start? Everybody's entitled to, to uh, information. Uh, we have it already in, uh, on, on labeling, whether it's calories, uh, whether it's uh, 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 gluten free, uh, whether it's uh, how much potassium is, is in there. There's, as a matter of fact, at last count, there's some 3,000 different items that, uh, that get associated with labeling. And there's good reason. Uh, people want to know that uh, they're concerned about their health, they're concerned about, about their safety, and they want to know what's in, what's in their food. At the same time, we don't want to uh, harm somebody or hurt somebody or punish somebody who has no control or, or ability to understand whether they may have uh, GMO-related uh, uh, material uh, in, in a product that they may have on a shelf or uh, something that they put forward for public sale. If you're at a farmer's market, and somebody is putting uh, eggs out for, for sale. We don't want to say, well, you you got to be able to absolutely guarantee that the nowhere in the feed that came, maybe to the chickens that you have in your backyard, came from uh, GMO-related material. So everybody has to have that uh, assurance. 
And so uh, I got together with my good friend, uh, Pete Shaman, Peter Shaman, the governor of Vermont. Uh, he and I served together in the National Governors uh, Association. He's the president of the Democratic Governors Association. And uh, I got uh, Scott Enright, our Department of Agriculture chair, to meet with Mike Ross, uh, the Department of Agriculture in Vermont. They passed some legislation. It's under uh, uh, legal the challenge right now. But we want to take advantage of the Vermont experience and, and the uh, capacity of uh, Mike and, and, uh, and our a director to work together to try to craft some legislation that can meet constitutional muster. And I think we can do it. I'm certainly going to try and do that in a timely way. Senator. Yes, uh, thank you, Howard. <clears throat> I do believe that the consumer uh, has the right to know whether the food they eat uh, contains uh, G genetically modified organisms or not. But I do believe that it's um, under the federal jurisdiction and should be a requirement of the FDA. Um, I have expressed my openness to consider uh, GMO labeling laws uh, at the state level, and I'm glad to hear the governor is uh, reviewing Vermont and about its application. My criteria is simple. I just believe that our local retailers and our local farmers shouldn't have to bear a burden of the labeling effort, that they shouldn't um, be left holding the bag if a GMO product is mislabeled or unlabeled or not appropriately labeled. All right, uh, this is a question where you may know the first part of the answer, but not necessarily the second one. Part. Who do you support as the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate, Senate and why? <laughs> Is this a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think uh, the people of Hawaii uh, are very fortunate to have two very qualified candidates to step up to the table. <laughs> and um, have decided to offer their name uh, as a, a potential nominee for the United States Senate. You know, I hope that all of you will be compelled to vote. I think it's very important that you make that decision, and I'm confident that the people of Hawaii will make the right choice uh, for the U.S. Senate. My turn? Evidently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I had uh, three very excellent uh, choices. Uh, with the untimely passing of, of Senator Nolan, uh, the governor is called upon, whoever is governor is called upon to uh, make a choice uh, uh, for an appointment uh, to the U.S. Senate seat. Uh, the process for not, everybody who may not know it uh, completely is, is that the, the party of, of, the, of the person who is no longer able to serve, whether by injury or, or, or death, um, uh, has to nominate three people. Uh, it just isn't dreamed up by the governor. You have to nominate three people. In this instance, it was Representative Manabuza, uh, Lieutenant Governor Brian Schatz, and, and Deputy uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Esther Kiaia. Three very excellent people, uh, as manifest by the fact that uh, one was Lieutenant Governor, one was uh, a U.S. Representative, and one is now, Esther is now uh, uh, the Under Secretary of the Interior uh, for Insular Affairs out in the Pacific. And it was, it was she, if you look in the paper today, that was Esther sitting there with the Department of the Interior Department of Justice. Three excellent people, no question. What I determined to do was to try to pick the person that I felt of those three excellent people that had uh, the best chance to set a foundation for Hawaii's future. We all know that uh, the longer you serve in the United States Senate in particular, the longer you get your seniority, the more power that comes. To a small state like ours, that couldn't be more important. I made my vote, I extended my appointment on the basis of what I believe was what for the best future in Hawaii. And I'm confident that I did the right thing in that, and I'm confident as well that when the people make their choice in November, or if they make their choice in August, uh, that they are going to make a choice based on what Hawaii's people think is in the best interest of the state of Hawaii and the best interest of its future. And I'm confident for that.
right, it's time for uh, closing remarks. We're going to give uh, each of these gentlemen two minutes, and uh, based on the coin toss or whatever it was, they I, maybe they threw tea leaves. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, Senator Eager will go first. Thank you. I, I just wanted to start again by thanking the sponsor uh, for having this forum. I really believe that the people of Hawaii deserve to see both Democratic candidates uh, many times through election day so that you have a direct opportunity uh, to make a decision. I know I'm not the most eloquent speaker, but I have been preparing for this opportunity for all of my life. I have 35 years in the private sector, working as an engineer, as an executive, 29 years in the state legislature, with a track record of proven accomplishments in education, higher education, technology development, taxation, and most importantly, putting together balanced budgets. You know, I've raised three children, from taking them from preschool to college and, and graduate school. And I understand the challenges that each and every one of you and each and every family faces uh, in the state of Hawaii. I have served for my 29 years in public service by three simple guiding principles. First, be open and honest in communication. Be respectful and treat all views with respect. And then most importantly, do the right thing the right way. I'm running for governor because I believe that we deserve better. We, we deserve a new style of leadership that brings our communities together rather than divides them. I'm confident that the people of Hawaii will not let money determine the outcome of this election. They will choose what's in their best interest. And I believe that I'm the candidate that best re represents their best interest. I ask you to join the campaign. More and more people each and every day is joining us because they believe that they deserve a brighter Hawaii. Thank you very much. I ask, humbly ask for your vote on August 9th. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I of course want to thank you all for, for being here today. I, I hope you found this an, an enjoyable time. This is, isn't this great? That's what democracy is all about. That, that we all have a chance to not only have a say as to what our future is going to be, but, but to be able to act on it. All we have to do is look across the world today and see the struggle that people are going through, the terrible horror that some people are having to experience just to try and do what we take for granted here today. So one thing I don't take for granted, I've never taken for granted and will not take for granted, is the faith and trust that's been placed in me over these past four decades. Going back to 1974 and what my mom said, I hope I sat up straight uh, while I was speaking today, and I, I certainly hope you think I spoke up and, and, and spoke clearly here. But I've had the great advantage in Hawaii of having two moms. When my mom came out here, she was able to meet up with my, my Auntie Aggie Cope. I've been Hanai to the Cope family out in Waianae. My mom and, and my Auntie Aggie spent my, many, many, much time together. And my Auntie Aggie um, uh, combined with my mom to, to add a little something, one other thing to what I have to do in order to live up to my mom's, both my mom's values. And she said, you have to act in a phone way. Do the right thing. You might not always know what the right thing is to do. You might not always be able to please everybody by doing the right thing. But if you do, if you make that commitment, and people understand that that, that is the basis of your values, even if they're not with you on every issue, they will be with you when, when you say to them, you're for Hawaii. Then, and I can say from the bottom of my heart, that I'm grateful to all of you and for all of those who have supported me over these years. My sole purpose was to give and give back to Hawaii. Leadership requires action. Leadership and action in Abercrombie, I hope you conclude, have gone together for the good of Hawaii. In more of Hawaii.
And now Gordon Canella, the chairman of the Honolulu Japanese Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon, everyone. Would you agree that uh, Governor Abercrombie and Senator Ige were superb in trying to convince us? <laughs> On behalf of the Hawaii Association of Realtors, Hawaii Independent Insurance Agents Association, the Hawaii Society of CPAs, and the Land Use Research Foundation, I would like to thank both candidates for sharing their accomplishments and have plans if either are elected as our governor. I want to also thank our moderator, Howard Dykes, the human <laughs> job and today was just you know, no different and uh, uh, last but not least I would uh, like to thank all of you for attending our forum. I hope that you are all now a bit wiser about the issues and the candidates before us and as a result we will confidently cast your vote for the candidate of your choice. Please join me once again in thanking our candidates. Oh, yeah? I'll pass on that. I'm not much of a candy fan. <laughs> you get Jerry? Nice to meet you. All right. Well, I guess we'll, we'll talk later. Huh? See you around. Huh? <laughs>